Good morning. This morning's scripture reading will be in the book of Luke. So if you'll open up your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to make him and, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. The church said, amen. Thank you, Phil. We're going to talk about finding Jesus in, and I hope you're going to uh, be part of the thing with Joshua. I want you to realize that if you buy the shirt, it looks exactly like that on you. <laughs> it does. I mean. So if any of you guys want to look like that, that's all you have to do is buy the shirt. Not bad for five bucks. We've been talking about finding Jesus and about what that really means and about finding Jesus in Scripture at first. And the response to finding Jesus in Scripture is faith. That's what it produces. And then we talked about finding Jesus in our sin, meeting him there because he's comfortable there, and it produces repentance. And today we want to talk about finding Jesus in our need, and in our need it produces rejoicing. So let's explore that a little bit more. As you look at this story of the paralytic, it's one of those stories that I'm not sure why, but it, it just really speaks to me, maybe because there's two stages to it. Uh, men try to bring Jesus to, or a man to Jesus. There's four of them. They're carrying this guy and can't get in, have to let him down through the roof, right in front of Jesus. Here he is. It's hard to ignore that. I mean, imagine they're breaking out the skylight up there and of course, that takes a lot longer ropes, I guess, but uh, that would distract you a little bit this morning, I think, uh, just trying to watch all that happen. So I think things may stop when that happens, and we're able to see some of that going on. Uh, as you look in Luke 5, though, they're very upset at this because Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Okay. Um, did they say, that's not why we're here? Do you think they came out with that? Not recorded in the text. They just trust Jesus to have done the right thing with what they are trying to do. They bring someone who has a need. His need is to be healed. That's what we would think. But it turns out Jesus says, no, your greater need is for you to be forgiven. And, and so he says, we your sins are forgiven. And of course, then they get upset at that and say, well, but who can forgive sins? 
And so he's lowered down into the situation where Jesus is. Who, which is easier, Jesus responds, to say your sins are forgiven or to heal a man who's paralyzed. And of course, then he just says, take up your bed and go home. And it's obvious proof. I can do either one. I can do both. But I want you to know that I have power to forgive sins. And so let me show you that by also meeting a person's need. And that's what he does. Does the paralytic need Jesus? Well, yeah. And Jesus thinks his greatest need is that sin. And he forgives sins first. What if we had a friend who would carry us to Jesus? Would that be a good thing? Would you like that? It might take four of them. I'm not sure people would respond to that. We're going to bring you to Jesus. Uh, That's okay. I'm just fine. No, no. We think you need to come see Jesus. And it might take us being paralyzed or four guys to be able to tackle us and say, No, today you are going to Jesus because we recognize you have a need whether you recognize you have a need or not. That's reading a lot into the story. It doesn't say the guy was objecting to this at all. But today it seems like people are very reluctant to come to Jesus. They don't really want to come to church. They don't want to have that rejoicing. If we had a sin, are we going to let somebody bring us to Jesus? Or are we going to say, that's okay, I'll get there sometime. Well, for our situation, I think we've already done that. We've already said, yes, I want to come see Jesus. But as you look at the world around us, I'm not sure that they're so willing. So the application is we need four big guys. No, that's really not going to work, is it? Because I think the guys have got to at least be willing. Jesus sees their faith, and probably the four as well as the guy on the mat. And Jesus says, I'll forgive your sin before I'll heal you. You see, I think we don't want that because for Jesus to forgive our sin means we're not going to do it anymore. We're going to stop. That that's not something going to be part of our life. That's not going to be part of what we say. That's not going to be part of how we act. We cannot ever go there again. And so I think maybe people are a little bit reluctant to do that. And it seems like it would be very public. I mean, bringing him in front of everybody else. Here's a paralyzed guy, and he's got a, I don't know, it's a a flexible mat or a hard cot or whatever it is that they're bringing him before that. How big a hole do you have to tear for him to come down in front of everyone? And as you're looking at that, it it, it just kind of calls attention to you and makes you pretty public. And uh, we really don't want everybody looking at us and Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven, and everybody going, oh, wonder what he did. You know, he's got to have done something really bad that they had to get him to Jesus this quickly, that they had to tear a roof off. I mean, this has got to be an emergency, right? For him to have, for, and that does not happen at all. See, they're not concerned about the man. They're not even thinking about, well, what did he do? Because the focus isn't on him. The focus is on God. And so, as you look at the response, it's, it's not so much about the man. And I think that's what we're concerned about, is if we would come to Jesus and need forgiveness, we're going to think, oh, everybody's going to know that I did something. We already know that. It's just now you're saying it. In fact, everybody's here has done something. And it's just whether or not we're willing to say it. And that's really what it's all about. I know the coming forward thing is way out of style because people don't want to go in front of other people to say that they've done anything wrong. Well, at least you're not tearing the roof off. And it isn't about what you did. It's about rejoicing before God. Because that really is what happens. The proof is, we want you to pick up your bed and go home. And as Jesus says, you know, pick up your bed and go home, that's really the proof of the whole thing. Not come up on the stage. Not get applause. Not go out into the marketplace. and No, just 
Pick up your bed and start living this normal life. This is what it takes. As a person who has been healed by Jesus Christ, as a person who is now a child of God, as a person who now has God in their life so that they're able to say, this is now what my life is about. I'm not like that other person. I've been healed. I've been cleansed. I've been... Everything is gone now, and now I'm able to have this great relationship with God. And the proof is in the power of our life, the fact that we changed it, the fact that we went for something else. You see, if we just lay there forgiven, it doesn't seem to do as much, does it? But when we are willing to put him into our life, where praising God comes and use forgiveness for healing as a means of praising God, it's one of those things that impresses everyone. It's like picking up your prison and going home, picking up your limitations and saying, those are not going to hold me anymore. Take the crutches away because I don't need these to walk out of here. The response is rejoicing, glory, awe coming from all the people around. It's healing, is is filling our need, is showing the power of God. And it really is about the power of God. Any healing is not really about us or about what we did or about the past. It's more about the future and about what God is doing right now in our life and about that healing process. And the end of the passage is we have seen extraordinary things today. Isn't that great? How often do we see extraordinary things? Every time God meets a need. Every time God meets a need. There ought to be rejoicing and there ought to be this sense of awe that we've seen extraordinary things today. And that's really the response that comes out of it. When you start looking at a couple of other stories, just to try and pull this out a little bit more, in Luke 17 we find the story of the ten lepers. It says, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And when they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So ten lepers. And they're crying out, have mercy on us. And Jesus does, and so he heals them. They're just outside the city because they really can't be in the city. They really can't be around other people because this is so highly contagious. Leprosy is a horrible disease. It's literally where your skin and where your flesh starts to decay before you die. It's like it eats, yeah, it's worse. You're not even going to want lunch after this. But it's highly contagious, And you cannot be around anyone else. And so they're outside the city right before he goes in. And Jesus heals them. They were cleansed. They were made to be free. And this idea of cleansing is like being free from guilt or sin, being free from disease, being free of toxins that are in your body, being free to be healed and healing and cleansing are used interchangeably here as we look at this. And so leprosy is this horrible need that we have. We recognize it. We see it. It's You're literally falling apart physically. And so certainly that would be a huge need. And the response for those coming back is only one guy. It's not all the others. It's just one guy. But his response in coming back is for praising God. And that's what it's all about. He's able to praise God. He's rejoicing. And Jesus gives the clear reason of why this is supposed to be by his indication. It is about praising God. That is supposed to be the response. He says, 
Is it just a Samaritan who came back to praise God? Where's the other ones? Because they should have had rejoicing in their life as well. And maybe it gives us the first hint that not everyone does. Sometimes when we have been healed by God or cleansed, we don't show any gratitude. We don't really show anything else. We just kind of say, oh, well, that's good. Let me just go on my way or about time or something like that. There's not a praise and a rejoicing for the fact that God has now been glorified in us because his power has been made known to the world through our need. And that's really what's happening. It's God being able to say, let me show you what I can do in your situation and in your need because that's what God does. Why doesn't healing or solving need create praise? And so many times when you solve someone's need, it almost makes them bitter. And they're like, well, it's about time, and therefore you know that somehow they've missed the point. There should be praise for God in every time when need is solved. Not praise to the guy who filled it, but praise to God. Because that's really the response for fulfilling this need. And God's praise is the right response in all of this. When we're healed of guilt, when we're healed of fear, when we're healed of rejection, it should result in praise. But we realize God is also kind to ungrateful people. And he understands this and he knows this. And so Jesus says, your faith has made you well. That's what healed you. Is there an unhealing that goes with it for the other nine? They're walking along, oh, that was good, and all of a sudden, we got it back again. I guess we should have gone and re... I don't think there's an unhealing. God's not quite that cruel to do that, but, uh, you know, it it might uh, wake up some people if, you know, if there's not enough praise going on, then, well, no, he's not going to do that. But we find ourselves in need from disease, from disaster, from lack of resources all the time. When Jesus heals our deepest needs, then our heart can rejoice. And that's really what it's about. We find Jesus in need, and it's the gratitude that we have that needs to show. Not just gratitude for the fact that now we're out of a situation, but gratitude that we have a God who is able to do such wonderful things. I think this is one of the things that's most important to see. I realize that sometimes we don't ask for the right things either. Look at Acts chapter 3. The story is of Peter and John on their way to the temple. And they're going there at the hour of prayer. And there's a guy who's been sitting by the gate, beautiful, for a long time. And they probably have seen him before as they go into this gate. And he's asking for alms, money. He's lame. He can't work. This actually is his work. This is the prescribed way of doing things is, you know, ask for other people to help. And so he does. And in verse 5, it says, and he fixed Peter and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from, excuse me, that's the man, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and he began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Well, what a great thing. You see the walking and leaping and praising God. That's the response to the fact that he's been healed. Well, he's been lame for a long time. He's been in this condition. He's been having to do this. And now all of a sudden he's released from it. Does it solve all of his problems? Not at all. Because he was laying there asking for money for lunch. Well, now he has no lunch. And not only that, but he can no longer really ask for alms for a former lame man. Does that make sense? I was lame before. Please give me money. I think he's just lost his status as a guy who can be given anything. 
So I'm not sure it solves everything, but it solves his need. And what I want you to realize the most about this one is the guy's asking for the wrong thing. And I see this a lot today. We're asking for what we think we need for the immediate. And so he's asking for, do you have any change? Do you have any money? Because here I am, this is the condition I am, and it's not going to get any better. And so the best I can do is say, can I have money for lunch? And Peter doesn't give him any. How horrible is that? Can we be a good Christian and not give money? But what he does is say, let me meet your need. And because he's lame, he is able to take him and raise him up, and the guy is so excited about it. He's rejoicing about it. That's what I needed. He doesn't stand there tapping his foot going, all right, now where's the cash? It's not like that at all because he recognized this is the miracle of God. This is what I really needed. I needed for someone to look at my life and to say, you know what, it isn't the money you need. It's really that you need to be healed. And your life is now free. You can go and do. You're able to be open and free. And he says, and I choose to use that to praise God. What a great thing that is as you look at how he is. And he, he, he thought it was one thing, but it's really something else that he needs. And what he really needs is to be healed from this horrible disease. And so he's able to raise up and to go. As Peter looks at the situation, maybe he sees it different. I think he's seen the guy there before. And it's, it's one of those situations where he's looking at him and it all of a sudden occurs to him, you know what? Here's the need. I don't think we always see it. I don't think we always understand. We may look at people and not know how to help them at all. But then there are times when we see exactly what they need. He's raised up so he's able to rejoice, able to walk. And that is the right response, the rejoicing that occurs after that. Another story is found in John chapter 11. And that story is of Lazarus. And the part I want to mention is before he ever gets to Lazarus. In the beginning of the chapter, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment to, and wiped her feet with, his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And Jesus waits. Well, they already sent. You know what that means when they send for you and say, you need to gather the family. You need to... We understand that means he's close to the end. And Jesus waits two more days. And by waiting... Two more days, he's now been dead four days. Jesus does not meet the need. They express what the need is, both Mary and Martha, because when Jesus comes, they both say exactly the same thing about the need. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. That was our need. If you had come, he would not have died. I don't think they're trying to blame Jesus or blame God, but they're just saying it would have been different if this need could have been met. We have faith in you. We believe. We understand. We know. We're understanding what this is all about. So what do we get out of this? You see, when God didn't meet the need... Grief and loss result, not rejoicing. But by Jesus not meeting their need, it's because he wants greater glory. So that the Son may be glorified through it. 
It is for the glory of God. It does reflect the glory of Jesus Christ, and it is delayed. Jesus didn't come because he wants greater glory. There's greater rejoicing over a man raised from the dead than there would be over a man who is sick. And it may be significant that Lazarus is a friend. Because I'm not sure you do this just to anyone, but you can take advantage of your friends, right? They'll put up with a lot more than the rest of the people. And so, he says, do you believe? Do you have faith? Jesus' statement is, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And just because it does not happen immediately, and there may not be reason for rejoicing immediately, is because there is a time of greater glory coming. And it is a time when he will be glorified through this. There's a lot of things that are working together in this passage as you look at it. For the glory of God so that Jesus can be glorified through it, correct? Well, how is Jesus glorified through it? How is Jesus glorified through his need? Because Lazarus basically acts out the story of Jesus. He goes through what Lazarus did. Jesus died as a sacrifice for our sins. He paid the price, and the glory is in his resurrection. And the glory is in Lazarus' resurrection, that Jesus might be glorified when we realize God raises the dead. It's why we worship today, isn't it? Because we've all been healed. We've been healed of sin. We've been cleansed by the Son of God. He went through the cross for greater glory. And he prayed that it would be taken away and God did not respond. And so sometimes when we, in our need, find that it isn't taken away and it isn't fulfilled immediately right now, it may be for greater glory. Man, that's a hard concept to get to, isn't it? And Lazarus goes through death for greater glory because, okay, who can argue with Jesus and how? He's got a guy who's been raised from the dead. And it's not long before Jesus will go through the same thing. When our need is not met, it's so God can be glorified in a greater way. And we see that. We know that. We hear that in the New Testament through and through. Philippians chapter 2 talks about this enabling of Jesus as he humbles himself, as he comes before God. It says, in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What an incredible thing to realize that's exactly what Jesus is doing, and that's what we do as well. Every time that we find our need and realize, God, you're going to meet this one. God, you're going to be there. God has highly exalted him. Name above all names. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. What an incredible thing. He has this healing For the glory of the Father. That's the reason for it. It's the reason Jesus went to the cross. Is for the glory of the Father. Well how do we know? Because some people take up their bed and walk. Some of us. And the glory of the Father through Jesus Christ. Is seen in us every single time. As he has been raised from the dead, now seated at the right hand of God, that power is now made available in our life. And as our sins are forgiven and as the rejoicing comes, it's because we realize that his need was met 
by the glory of the Father, our need also is going to be met by the glory of the Father. And some will live free from guilt because they've been cleansed by Jesus Christ and now they're forgiven and they no longer have any reason for feeling any distance from God whatsoever. You realize it's such an incredible thing when Jesus says, take up your bed. You're free. You can walk. You can live this life. You can live in power. You can be full of the Holy Spirit. You don't have anything to feel guilty or ashamed about because Jesus has glory when needs are met. And that's really the way it works. So maybe somebody carried you in here. I don't see many paralyzed people today, so I'm not sure how they got you here. Did they have to force you? But the healing is now present for God to give sins through Jesus Christ. And it's time to claim your healing. It's time for rejoicing to begin. It's what worship is all about. It's the fact that we have all had our needs met in Jesus Christ. And we need to be cleansed. We need to be whole again. And your forgiveness is possible. We can be rid of all of our guilt. And we need to be able to praise God for what he has done. It's the most incredible thing. But maybe today you're still trying to get to God. It's not that hard. It's all about the rejoicing over what God's about to do in your life. So can we come to him now? Some of us because we need him, some of us because the need's been filled, and it all results in praise to God. Let's stand and sing.